<clears throat> Hello, uh, my name is John. Um, Easy, right? It's going to be. For about the cloud, when you control your own hardware, uh, and how it impacts the decisions to make. So first off, look, show of hands, uh, application developers, yeah. DBAs, yeah. sysadmin network admin types, all the above. Um, <clears throat> yeah, it's a... Uh, I am an application developer. You guys hear me? Nope. All right. I'm an application developer. Um, <clears throat> so that's where I'm coming from with this. But of course, when you work in the cloud, you end up noticing things are different. And at my core, I am sciencey. I want to figure out why things are different. So uh, <clears throat> in shared virtual hosting, things are different. So let's say you're me, for example, and you're keeping an eye on your database disk operations, your writes and your reads, and this is pretty normal, you know. There's tr there's some traffic, a little little rise at the end. That's fine. It's it's the lunch rush, you know. And then you start noticing that that there some of these things are are dipping rather low. You know that's. That's odd, right? Then you start noticing that, that these low dips are, are taking pretty significant chunks of time, um, <clears throat> uh, even larger chunks of time, and, and even larger, and sometimes, you know, rather significant 10 minute sort of no disk operations happening at all. And sometimes you get really, really degraded performance. And sometimes you just fall off the cliff. Yeah, this, this is shared hosting, right? It's different. Um, <clears throat> it's different because you're not in control. If, if, if that were happening on a machine I controlled, I'd say pull out the broken disk, right? Replace something. Something is wrong, we can fix it. Um, in shared hosting, that's not obvious. We can't do that. Um, <clears throat> or at least we can't do that as easily. We can't do that in the same way. So what was going on there? Uh, <clears throat> so the new situation is that all disks are network attached, attached to storage. Right. There's, there's, for all intents and purposes, there's no such thing as a local disk. Yeah, in you know, other than you're on, on EC2, you've got your root partition where your, you know, your kernel lives. That's local. That's about it. Uh, <clears throat> and anything that is shared can quietly screw you. Yeah. So what was happening in this case was that Someone else on the instance was running PG Bench or Bonnie or something like that that was absolutely saturating the disk I.O. Uh, <clears throat> and, uh, and that's good. Uh, unfortunately, everything is shared. So we need to figure out ways to adapt and figure out ways to work around that. So all disks are network attached to storage. Um, that means everything goes through the same pipe. All of your network traffic, all of your disk traffic, everything goes through the, the same pipe. So all of your replication traffic. We had a situation uh, recently where we had a, a very heavily written database and we were replicating out to a, to a standby. And it was, this, this database was, was cripplingly slow, it was falling down. And so we needed to get a new instance up. So we, we added an additional standby to replicate from, and that caused it to die because the pipe was just too saturated. <clears throat> uh, all of your other incidental internet traffic is, is going all across this, right? So when you actually query your database and get data back, that's, that is going over the same pipe as the data that's being written to disk. And when you do silly things like, you know, torrent the new season of 
Doctor Who, um, <clears throat> you know, that's going to that's going to hurt your performance. And the additional problem is, with this is that you're on the same pipe as everyone else on that machine. So you get to use it for your disk and your network. They also get to use it for their disk and their network. And you're not going to be playing together, right? Uh, <clears throat> so everything is shared. That means that all disks are shared, which means you can see the, the, the progression from the story that I told at the very beginning, right? You will get dead zones occasionally. Uh, <clears throat> your RAM is shared, and it's over allocated. So there are times when you're told that you have 15 gigs of RAM, but in fact you have 10 gigs of RAM, and that last five gigs is actually in swap. And you, on a virtual machine, have no way of knowing that that's the case. Your CPU is shared, and I hate to break it to you, there's just not much you can do about that. Some of these other problems we can start to work around, start to adapt strategies for. CPU, if someone's running a bunch of compute stuff, and you need that CPU, you know, there's going to be problems. So the genesis of this talk was going through a bunch of the old optimization rules that were developed around hardware that we control and looking at what they, what they actually meant in a situation where we don't control the hardware. Right? So let's talk about the old rule, index everything. Right? That's an exaggeration, obviously. But if there's a speed problem, add an index. Figure out what the query is, figure out what the, the index is that you need, and index it, right? That works great on hardware that you control. But it doesn't work great when the, the latency of random reads is incredibly high. And this, that's unfortunately the nature of network attached storage, and especially contended network attached storage. Sequential reads are still, they might have latency, but once you get there, you're there. Random reads, you have the latency, and it's happening every single block that you read. So <clears throat> index everything is no longer a kill-all strategy. You can't do it consistently, and you, and you won't get consistent improvements from it. Uh, <clears throat> so are you guys familiar with Bonnie++? Plus Plus? Yeah? OK. So I, I ran Bonnie++ Plus Plus on a bunch of different EC2-based storage media. So on the root drive, you know, we've got some surprisingly bad performance here. Right? Uh, we've got two different ephemerals, and they, they seem to match up roughly, right? We've got uh, <clears throat> sequential input, or sequential outputs produced straightforward, pretty close to each other. Sequential inputs pretty close. Then we go, get to your random seeks, and, and this seems significantly faster, except then you realize it's milliseconds instead of nanoseconds. Uh, um, I'm sorry. Yep. No, this is, you, this, this is, in fact, significantly faster. Um, <clears throat> this is significantly slower. Um, <clears throat> and you can run Bonnie++ plus plus on any ephemeral drive and get a different result every time. Um, <clears throat> uh, you can, you know, if you use EBS, EBS has a, a, a reputation for being slower than ephemeral. What its reputation is really about is being more variable than ephemeral. And this is actually a problem. Variability is the problem. Once things are variable, they're unpredictable. And once they're unpredictable, you can't optimize them. Uh, <clears throat> uh, and rating can help, but not always, because it relies on the underlying hardware. And if the underlying hardware is unpredictable, then you know, you're you're going to have a rough time. Um, just, I, I've got a little, you know, if you want to compare the local uh, solid state drive on my laptop, um, there's, it's kind of a night and day figure. Um, you know, your, your random seeks, uh, pretty, pretty significantly different. Um, anyway, so there's, I, I encourage you, if you're on EC2, if you're on any virtual shared hosting, to run Bonnie++ Plus Plus and run it, you know, on the same place three different days in the week. 
and see how consistent it is. Run it at different points in, uh, uh, in time during the day, not necessarily during your traffic times, but during what might be other people's traffic times, and you'll see significant differences. So the new rule is you want to encourage sequential reads. That means you want to partition. You want to cluster. Indexes are, are still useful, and they're still needed. But what you really want is a, a table that's small enough to fit in RAM. It gets read once. You do all you need to do it, and that's it. And you do that by cutting it up into little partitions, even partitions on the same drive. Corollary, random read cost, you remember this? All right. So it, the old rule was that it comes awfully high, it's an awfully pessimal value. You know, Postgres configuration is really pessimal, d designed for 32 megabyte RAM systems, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, <clears throat> but you actually shouldn't lower it blindly, benchmark. Consider lowering it, but consider raising it too. You want, to, you want to encourage those sequential reads. So bumping it up a few, probably not a bad idea. Um, on the production systems that I'm running, it's about double the default value right now. The old rule, effective cache size. Make it half your RAM. Unless it, you've got a low RAM instance. Make it about half your RAM. That's probably what the system's going to keep in cache for. This works great as long as it's actually RAM, right? <laughs> if it's unused memory, then it might have been swapped out, and you won't know. And, and it will look like RAM to the system, but it will act like swap when you try to retrieve it. So it'll be just as slow. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah. um, so the new rule, raise it, but raise it conservatively. I aim for about a quarter of the RAM. And the physics, the science behind it is that you, you need it to be active. Anything that sits in RAM will suffer from getting put away. So if you actually have an active set that's going to be in half of the RAM and being loaded from disk on a regular basis and, and keep it, then go ahead and do your half RAM. If you don't, keep it lower. Old rule, put your transaction log on a different spindle, different device, somewhere. Actually, that works. Um, that still works, which I, I was surprised at because my ops person was like, no, there's no way. It's all on the same pipe. I'm like, well, all right, well, I'll try it and see. And it does. It does still work. Um, it's not a panacea. Of course, it never is, right? But right traffic, it's the, the one disk gets the transaction log on the other disk, and you do get a uh, you know, significant speed up, depending on the question. Um, the, I was testing in EXT, uh, yeah, XT3, XT4. Um, I haven't done any of the, the fancy systems. But, um, now, there is a caveat. It works as long as you're not hitting the bounds of your pipe. As soon as your throughput is so big that you're, you're starting to get throttled by your network connection, then your, it doesn't matter where your transaction log files are. Because you can't send it out quickly. Um, <clears throat> that's another, just to harken back to the index issue, that's another situation, another problem with indices is that they add to your rights. And if you've got a narrow pipe that you can pipe through, if you, and that's highly contended, you want to reduce the number of writes you're doing, much more so than when you're in a situation where you control the hardware. Can you make sure that actually so yeah, so that's the same thing. Um, Ray, what's that? How do you make sure it's actually on a different spin? So the, the question is, how do you ensure that it's actually on a different device? And it, it might be too easy to. 
it's it's absolutely true that you could you know uh, if if you're running um, on a on a, a machine that has two ephemeral drives and you put your transaction log on one and your disk on another or your uh, database on another then it might actually be the same disk and you don't know in, in practice I haven't run into this but also in practice I, I tend to to if if I'm at the point where I'm putting things on different devices I I tend to be involving EBSs, electronic box stores, or whatever, you know, elastic box stores. Um, <clears throat> so, and those are uh, much less likely to be on the same uh, machine. Um, and if you if you want to guarantee it, then have your database on your electronic or your elastic box store and your transaction log on your ephemeral, because there's no way those are going to overlap. But in practice, what you want to do is set it up and look at it and watch it and make sure it's giving you the performance that you expect it to. And if it doesn't, yeah, we'll get there. Uh, <clears throat> so RAID, what's the best RAID level? One plus zero, or, or zero plus one. Um, there are people who will fight about that. Uh, <clears throat> on the cloud, that's not necessarily tr true. Right? There for a couple of reasons. And this is actually a situation where the cloud can help us. One, mirroring doubles your rights. So you want to avoid mirroring generally uh, if you're feeling right contended. Two, you don't actually need that mirroring redundancy because you're already using an EBS, which is going to be mirrored somewhere. Right? This is one of the things that you use Amazon for in the first place, or whatever your hosting provider is. You know, that's, that's the benefit. So you should go ahead and use it. Um, <clears throat> now, there are situations where, where RAID 1 still makes sense, right? If you're writing very infrequently and you're reading frequently, then RAID 1 can make a lot of sense because it will normalize. It will make your reads more consistent. If one of your drives gets slow, it doesn't matter because one of the other ones is likely to be fast. RAID 0 makes sense for, for writes because you can actually send the writes out across different devices, assuming they are, in fact, different devices, and uh, uh, gain some speed that way. But yes, only, only do this after benchmarking. <laughs> so half of these are, are for my benefit. <clears throat> So the, the really new rules about living in this space is that you need to make it easy to rebuild because ultimately, if you end up in a situation where you're convinced that your transaction log and your database are on the same device even though you've got them on separate devices, then your only solution is to rebuild. You create new devices and add them or you find yourself on a situation where you're, you're uh, throughput is getting throttled on a regular basis, like mine was at the beginning of this. And the solution to that is to kill the instance and get a new instance and hope that it's not on as trafficked a machine. I mean, it's... So accept that and make it easier to rebuild. You can put your databases on EBSs. You can you know, do all sorts, make sure that you're, you're replicating Make sure you've got all of your various uh, standby and rebuild options out there. Whatever your strategy is, you need to make sure that you can rebuild quickly when you need to. Um, <clears throat> and the other thing is make sure that you're watching. Right? When you've got your own hardware, it's easy to kind of ignore it unless you see a major spike or a blink and light starts, you know, futzing. Um, you, know, you really have to watch this stuff. You have to watch and you have to make sure that when you see that, that it's not actually the server, it's not doing anything, it's the server's hanging. And you need to be able to respond to that. And the response is generally um, So to recap, random reads are more expensive. And you have to think about that. And it's not that random reads specifically are more expensive, it's that the latency is so highly variable and random reads get hit by that because you have to do more of them to get the same stuff. Um, sequential reads are 
not faster, they're just more predictable. The latency variability doesn't affect them as much because uh, you get more stuff in the same group. Uh, use RAM, but remember it's not all yours. You don't have control over all of them. So you want as much stuff to, as possible to be in RAM, but you have to make sure you're using it or it might go away. Okay. Uh, you can't load everything into RAM and then just hope that it'll continue to be there. You know, RAM disks are not a great option um, if they're intended to be static. You have to make sure that they're, they're, they're being poked. Um, <clears throat> and figure out what the cloud is actually good at and let it do that stuff. Um, finally, yes, I, I've been hinting at this, I've been perhaps saying this, but consistent is the new object. Right? You, you need to build consistency in these highly variable systems, however you're doing it. And there are a lot of different ways of doing it. But consistency is what you need to look for and what you need to aim for. And once you've got consistency, then you can, you know, do your lateral scaling, you can do anything you want. But without it, you're optimizing a puff of air. All right. At this point, do we have any questions? So the question is, uh, is there any backup data on the notion that indexes are not necessarily the best way to go about things? Uh, <clears throat> and the answer is not exactly. Uh, but let's take a look at an example, Amazon instance of that. So we've got a database. This is actually just a PG bench database. And we can, you know, do a simple, can everyone, everyone see this, by the way? Right. It's big enough. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, PG Bench, but it's, you know, the, the accounts table is sort of the big data table there. Um, and someone pick a random number between 1 and 400. 42. Oh, very important. Turn on time. All right, so <clears throat> uh, indexes are still important. This is an almost entirely unindexed table. P PG Bench builds it this way specifically. There is, there is an index on the primary key, but I'm querying something that's not the primary key. And there are uh, 40 million rows in this table. Yeah, it will come back, don't worry. <laughs> It's, but it's giving me a lot of time to, to talk to you. Um, <clears throat> so the, uh, <laughs> um, I specifically built it this large to force it to be larger than RAM, right, so that I could run tests where it was larger than RAM. Um, and this is happening on an ephemeral drive, not an EBS, just in case you're wondering. Uh, and it is the, in, in the research that I've done over the past few weeks, ephemeral drives are, in fact, generally, but not always, faster than EBSs. Um, <clears throat> All right, so exactly 100,000 um, where, where that's the appropriate, appropriate. And that took a little less than a minute to run. So if we uh, connect to, let's say, the database where I took the same data and partitioned it. Now, let me, let me just show you real quick what the, uh, the table looks like, because I didn't do that to begin with. So, uh, yeah, we've got, uh, this is the primary key of the table. We've got another integer there. We've got a balance, which represents something, and stuff, which represents stuff, basically. Right? This is PG Bench. It's, it's trying to put data in. It's trying to do updates and selects and inserts. Um, <clears throat> now, I've split it out. There are, there are uh, 400 bits, if I do a max and an in bid, it goes between one and four, that's why I asked for those, those bounds. Uh, and I split them into partition tables every 50, right? But no additional indexes. Um, so 
what do people think? How, how long is this going to take? Eight seconds? Okay. Anyone else? We'll see. So, <clears throat> uh -huh. yeah, there we go. Seven seconds. All right. That's an excellent question. I'm glad that you asked. What, how long will it take with a unitary table and an index? And the answer is really fast. Now, we've got 400 million uh, rows in this table. So each of the partition uh, tables in the partition example um, has 50 million rows. There are eight of those. Um, so it's doing a sequential scan across eight, 50 million rows. And the way PG Bench builds its data, it's building it incrementally, it's building it pretty sequentially, and ultimately these are pretty small databases. This entire database is less than six gigs of data, uh, including uh, the primary key index. So yes, in this case, an index is going to be faster generally. And in fact, we can, we can look at the hybrid situation as well, because I'm fancy that way. And you'll see that it's even faster. Nope. In general, it's even faster. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and I'll go back to, so the, let's go back to the variability thing. This time, this select time, as I've seen it take as low as 45 seconds and as long as 130 seconds. Uh, <clears throat> this select time I've seen take as long as eight seconds and as, as little as six. There is a slightly less variability there, but very slightly. <clears throat> this I've seen take 1.3 seconds. seen that take as long, but I've only had this database for less than a day. So. Uh, <clears throat> so to, as a, a little trip down uh, uh, some of the research I've been doing, yeah, the indexes will still help. Probably. Uh, <clears throat> partitions will help guaranteed and will help in a very consistent way. Uh, and if your partitions are, are small enough, then obviously they'll be better than indexes, but who, who can manage 400 partitions, right? or 4,000 partitions? Um, <clears throat> uh, certainly not me manually. You know, you're getting into some heavy scripting territory there. Um, <clears throat> so this is why I, I stress that you need to benchmark. You know? And in this case, um, I would stick with the partitions table because adding to it's gonna be faster. Querying it ad hoc is going to be faster generally, um, as long as you're not doing um, uh, big spanning queries. I mean, this is sort of the, the fun part, is that if you go back to uh, the original database and do an unconstrained query, it's going to take the exact same amount of time, right? Because all you're doing is a, you know, a sequential scan of the entire table every single time. Um, <clears throat> And by exact same time, I mean, you know, somewhere between 45 and 130 seconds, right? <laughs> um, <clears throat> and if the smaller your tables, the more predictable that is. And that's, that's the one I'm sure. Um, and obviously, clustering is another strategy, and in order to cluster, you do need to use indices. So I'm not saying don't create indices, I'm saying use partitions and clustering, try and encourage sequential reads because your, your, the variability of latency is going to impact you less in that case. So a hybrid approach is necessary and benchmarking is necessary. A little faster. Any other questions? All right, bonus round. Postgres equal 9.2 dropped recently, right? Remember my advice? Never create indexes. They're bad, right? Um, obviously, you know, the 9.2 is in place. You, you, you should use the 9.1. Um, <clears throat> the test database I'm running is 9.1, just in case you were wondering. Uh, and 
in all seriousness, um, 9.2 does have significant improvements in certain types of queries where the data is, that you need is in the index. The index only scan um, is actually incredibly helpful even in uh, a virtualized environment because instead of doing a sequential read over a table, even a partition table, instead of doing a sequential read of the index, which is much smaller, and then random reads into the table, you're just doing the sequential read of the index. So you're, you're, it's good because it's sequential. Um, it's good because it's you know sort of all there and it eliminates random reads. So uh, if you can uh, upgrade to 9.2, I would I would encourage it. We're encouraged. We're in uh, in the process of upgrading to 9.2 for um, the team that I'm on in, in, in Jan Ray, which is the company that I work. And uh, we're in a, a privileged spot to be able to do that because obviously. Once you're in production, things are harder to change, but will serve as sort of the bellwether for other teams. Um, but be careful, again, because every index you create you know, is going to be additional rights, and you want to make sure that you don't have too many of those. Um, bonus round, salt state drives. Amazon recently introduced a solid state virtual machine. I'm sure you guys have, have heard of it if you're in this room. Um, and uh, you know, remember my advice? Don't use indexes, they're horrible. I hope tomorrow. Uh, <clears throat> again, that's, uh, that's not the whole truth. But um, SSDs, they don't actually make random reads significantly better, but they even the field between random and, se and sequential reads. Your sequential reads are not really sequential along the platter reads anymore, right? They're bits and bytes on a, on a solid state drive. Um, <clears throat> the latency is much, much lower. There's still some variability, but since the latency itself is so significantly smaller, the variability is, is proportionally smaller. So SSDs are, in fact, hugely useful in this case. Any other questions? Yes. I have, as a matter of fact. So we recently, you may recall, uh, I earlier mentioned a, a machine that was under extremely heavy write load, and we attached an additional standby to it, and everything dro you know, dropped its basket completely. Um, <clears throat> that additional standby was an SSD that we were trying to move into. Uh, and once we did move it to, it went from something where we could not run, we couldn't run a report longer than three weeks to a, 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 a system that we could run reports of upwards of 18 months. Um, now, one of the reasons, this, this was a very special case because it was absolutely right saturated in a way that, um, you know, even impressive online transactional uh, processing databases are not likely to be um, <clears throat> because of the, the summary table setup that we had, had determined for it. Um, so and a single transaction came in and actually caused an update in approximately uh, 15 tables with all the attendant indices. So there was no way around making that, you know, anything other than a right saturated thing. As soon as we got the SSD in, though, it continued to have a lot of writes, but they weren't throttling. Now, there are a couple of things that this might have been related to. One is the SSDs itself. Right? Obviously, those helped. The other thing is a very important concept in EC2 instance types called the IO throughput level. For most instance types, including the, the research instances that I was using, um, the I.O. throughput level is medium. For the small instances, it's low. And for the very large instances, it's high. What it means that something is high is that it, the physical device that it's attached to is guaranteed to have a 10 gigabit Ethernet attached to it. 
I believe. Which makes it a lot harder to saturate that. Right. So I don't actually know if our problem was the disk or the pipe. I do know that the new instance type both had SSDs and a higher guaranteed throughput. Which of those solved the problem, or if it was a consideration of both? That's, that's a good question. I'm not sure. Um, for a database which uh, had a similar amount of data, but was instead of doing a summary table set up like that, was instead doing partition, reasonably indexed partitions and querying fact tables directly. Um, in that case, comparing the throughput on a uh, 32 gigabyte RAM machine um, against the SSD machine, which had 60 gigabytes in an SSD. Uh, the improvement was noticeable, but not nearly as significant. It was about 20 to 30 percent, depending on the query. Um, <clears throat> so, obviously, in that case, I had taken all of this advice that I had given to myself to heart, and I had partitioned, and I had been spare with my indexes, and I had encouraged all of my queries to, to do sequential reads where they needed to, and, and uh, um, index reads only when absolutely necessary. Um, and I had tuned the database in a particular way. And when we moved that database over to an SSD, it was suboptimal for that side. Right. This is unfortunately the nature of the cloud. You need to know what machine type you're on. You need to know what it claims to be and you need to know what it's actually giving you. So, one final note is there's one additional effect that getting a high throughput instance will give you, and that is fewer other people on the same machine. I'm serious. Contention's a major problem, and if you get a more expensive instance, there will be less contention not just because the physical specs of the machine are higher, but because there are fewer people who are willing to afford it, or willing to pay for it. So, uh, question in the back? Just a comment, uh, harder knowledge here. Uh, the largest instance type, the prefix is like M1 or C2 or whatever. The biggest one with the prefix will be the only 10 down the box. So uh, uh, can you say that one more time? The, the largest instance mm -hmm. for a given prefix will be a single tenant in all existing cases. Amazon doesn't guarantee it, but it is a fact. All right. So uh, there's so, so the report from from the crowd is that uh, in Amazon has um, instance type tiers. They've got M1 and M2 and C1 and uh, I forget what the prefix is for for the SSD one. Um, <clears throat> so what, what you're saying is that if you get the largest in the M1 class, then although Amazon does not guarantee it, in fact, you will be the only tenant on that box. Right. I did not know that. Um, and that's an incredibly useful piece of information. You know, so you, in that case, you don't have to worry about contention from other tenants. You don't have to worry about your disk going away because someone's running benchmarks or, you know, having a sale. Um, and you don't have to worry about CPU contention. And you don't have to worry about your RAM being swapped out. That's a, a huge guarantee, and that brings you much closer to being able to know your hardware the way that you know your hardware when it's actually your hardware. Um, so that's a, that's a useful, useful thing to know. Any other questions? We kind of blew through this. Yeah. Um, so the question is, why do I recommend using ephemeral storage for databases? And the answer is, I'm not recommending that you use ephemeral storage for databases. I think that uh, ephemeral storage is going to be slightly faster. Whether or not that's a worthwhile thing, given the volatility of ephemeral storage in comparison to EBS, is something that, that only you can answer. Um, <clears throat> a setup that I've seen work reasonably well 
is having the primary instance be on ephemeral drives and the standby instance being on EBS. Because then you get the, the sort of resilientness of an EBS and that instance is not being hit by all of the read traffic that would you know, make an EBS show its weaknesses. Um, <clears throat> however, if that's your setup, then you run into the problem that when you do have to fail over, you're fail over, failing over to a machine that is less capable of handling it. Right? So it's a tough decision to make. Don't put your databases on the root drive. That's that much I can tell you. Uh, ephemeral? Maybe. Uh, are you referring to the fact that I said uh, put your database on the EBS and your transaction log on the ephemeral? Oh, you're referring to the fact that the SSDs themselves are ephemeral. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so, yes, it's true that uh, if you use an SSD, you'll get a huge speed boost and you will also not benefit from the sort of the, the cloud persistence layer. Um, so if that instance dies or gets corrupted, then you're, you're screwed. And if that instance, uh, with all of its SSD power and uh, high, high throughput power, um, goes away and your standby is on the EBS, it is not going to be prepared for the load. So you get two SSDs at several dollars an hour or whatever it is. Yeah, three ton an hour, depending on your availability zone, right? Um, <clears throat> and uh, uh, yeah, you swallow that cost no matter no matter how small a company you are. Um, so that's certainly one one approach to it, and that would work, but it's spending. Yeah, um, yeah. I I don't have a solution for you. I just have principles. Any other questions? So, is there one in the back there? No? No? All right. My name is John. Thank you for listening to me. Um, I hope you got something out of this, uh, even if it's depression. Um, <clears throat> uh, I work for a company called Jan Rain. We do hire people sometimes. Um, and if you're looking for a job, you should come by and, and talk to me. Um, and if you're not, you just want to shoot the shit. All right. Thank you very much.